week I'm going to visit the Chateau de Chenonceau with my mother and Percy, who are on their honeymoon. Are you excited, Mummy? Very excited. I've been here before, of course, but one never comes often enough to Chenonceau. And have you been here before, Percy? No, I haven't been here. I only attended with the best people, so I haven't met them before, so I couldn't come. Okay, well, I actually wanted to bring you here because I felt that the head of the maintenance team of La Lande <laughs> needs to check this place out, get a few ideas. Good. Good. You, you pick the finishes, so <laughs> don't worry me about them. Aren't they adorable? I feel as though I'm gate-crashing a honeymoon. This spectacular chateau has long been owned by very powerful women. No less than five queens and at least two royal mistresses have slept here. The most powerful of these women were Catherine de Medici and Diane de Poitiers. Catherine arrived from Italy to marry Henry II of France when they were both 14 years old. But Henry was already enamoured of his governess, Diane de Poitiers. They became lovers when he was about 15 and she was 35, and she ruled his heart and France until his death. Diane loved hunting and was often portrayed as the goddess Diana the Huntress. Henri gave her this chateau and she had the bridge built over the river so that she could get to the forest on the other side. She also attributed her lasting beauty to bathing naked in the river each morning. Now, I don't know which door Diane came out of to go swimming every day in the river, but maybe those little steps down there are a clue. Must have been quite a sight for the staff. Catherine had no choice but to tolerate Diane during Henry's lifetime, but on his death she forced Diane to swap this chateau for the Chateau de Chaumont, which I visited in vlog 26. She immediately started improving the chateau and added the beautiful building onto Diana's bridge. Between them, the two rivals created a masterpiece. Look at this stunning, weed-free courtyard. I'm shamed. Percy? Um, I really need a quick word with the maintenance team. I think the maintenance team have taken their eye off the ball in the courtyard. And I think that what we can learn from this courtyard is that it's possible to have one that isn't green. And that surprises me. When we have created the maintenance uh, money bit that we are talking of, we shall do those things. Oh, we've already created a maintenance money pit. We just haven't put any money in it yet. <laughs> when I tell you to provide a maintenance account, you say yes, yes, but that's where it stops. You are adept at diverting funds wherever you want them to go and not when they, where they need to go. At the moment, she's interested in yes. this courtyard, so she'll divert the funds there. Well, spotted, but tomorrow Percy. she will find something different. <laughs> Well, that's partly what it is to be a woman. Yes. I think one must live by our whims. That's Otherwise, I wouldn't be living in a chateau in the first place. That's why you refuse to make that list I want with the priorities to them. You change them every second day. <laughs> you may be pleased to know that Ben, Grant and I discussed exactly putting some of this on the courtyard when they were there earlier this year. Why did you stop yeah, at discussion? Well, we don't need to stop at discussion. See, this is why whims are good. You have a whim, you deal with it, it's done. Well, at the time, we thought it was more important to build a pergola. Oh, yes, that's true. Uh, it's true that the whim of the day was the pergola. Yes. So that that is true. And that's where <laughs> the money then went. <laughs> and the time <laughs> and the effort. Yes. All right, but now new whim is courtyard. So it was discussed. We shall think about it again. I love France. I'm certainly a Francophile. More than me, probably. Definitely more than you are. Now we're crossing the first small bridge over to the main chateau, the building of which was overseen by Louise de Brissonnet, whilst her husband was too busy dealing with the king's affairs. And what an excellent job she did. On the imposing entrance doors, we can see the coat of arms of Louise, the first of the famous women of Chenonceau. Here we are in Diane de Poitiers bedroom. Truly, this must be the heart of this home. And this was her actual bed. I wonder what she was really like, this woman who was able to enthrall a king for 25 years until his death. So mummy, that is the bed of Diane de Poitiers, the mistress of France. And apparently Flaubert said that he would rather spend one night in this bed alone with the memory of such a glorious mistress than to be in any other bed with real life people. What about you, Percy? Would you rather be in this bed alone with the memory of Diana? No, I would rather not. 
You have no imagination either of you. Flaubert was a man of great imagination. I'm not a fantasist. The vase, the bouquet, the flowers, everything is beautiful. I love that against the tapestry and in front of Diana's bed. And you can see there's a little sculpture next to the bed, which I suspect is Diana the Huntress. We'll go and have a look. Yes, it is. There's a naked goddess Diana next to a stag. Hmm, something tells me that maybe the portrait of Catherine de' Medici wasn't looking over Diana's bed in her lifetime. I suspect that was added after Catherine took over. On the chimney piece, you can see Catherine de' Medici's monogram, the entwined C's, next to her husband's monogram, the H. But when you put those two together, you get this. The official royal monogram, two C's and an H, which obviously looks rather like two D's and an H. I can't help but think that this royal monogram must have been a constant thorn in Catherine's side and a small daily triumph for Diane. After ousting Diane from the chateau and moving in herself, Queen Catherine chose this beautiful room as her study. And what a view. Here on the ceiling is the original paintwork with Catherine's monogram. So it would have been green in her day too. Somehow it feels right to see you in Catherine de Medici's study. I can imagine you running an empire from here. I think I could grow used to it. I bet you could. I can imagine Catherine here dealing with the affairs of state and planning the lavish parties that Chenonceau became famous for. Mummy's fitting right in because from that balcony five queens attended mass in this chapel. Catherine de Medici, her daughters Marguerite and Elizabeth, who married Henry IV of France and Philip II of Spain, and the wives of her three sons who all became kings of France, Elizabeth, Louise and Mary Queen of Scots, who was married to her son Francois. The Scottish guards of Mary Queen of Scots even left English graffiti in the chapel. This one says, Man's anger does not accomplish God's justice. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking, Poor Catherine de' Medici must have prayed so much in this chapel from up there on the first floor. She had ten children. She lost eight during her lifetime and a husband. Imagine the prayers she must have been pouring out here. How frustrating it must have been to her to see her children get sick and die whilst Diana seemed impervious to time. She was famed for remaining beautiful later in life. This portrait of her was painted when she was still very much the king's favourite, at the age of 57. Are you excited, Mummy? You're about to go up the first straight flight of stairs in France. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, no spiral staircase here. Well, oh, straight clicker. This was Catherine de' Medici's bedroom, and it is sumptuous. In the 16th century, beds became status symbols, and you can see that no expense was spared in this one. This bed is covered in carvings and shows just how important its owner was. But even the most beautiful bed in the world wasn't going to lure her husband away from his mistress. Here we are in the magnificent gallery that Catherine de' Medici built over Diane de Poitiers Bridge. The river's passing right below us. In June 1577, Catherine de' Medici threw a lavish party to inaugurate the opening of the new gallery in honour of her son, Henry III. This bacchanalia came to be known as the Ball of the Naked Breasts. She wanted to quash rumours that her son would be incapable of producing a royal heir because he liked dressing up as a woman and hanging out with his male friends a lot. So she invited all of the most beautiful women of the court, 60 of them, to come bare-breasted, clad in diaphanous, transparent fabrics, and serve the dinner. The feast was so lavish that she had to take out a loan just to cover the cost. Apparently, it was the same cost as an entire army. I, for one, am ready for the ball. Ready for the party? Stephanie, there are more important things in life. I, I find it absolutely surprising that Catherine de' Medici, who had had so many unhappinesses in her life, was so interested in parties. But in terms of a woman, did she actually enjoy partying? Or was it a, a means and a way to control her people? 
I think probably the latter. Surely I just need to inspire Mummy to get into the party spirit. Show us how it's done, Mummy. Is that, is that it? That's your dance? Oh, Mummy is getting into the spirit of the dance. Look at that grace and elegance. I can practically hear the elegant music and see the dashing courtiers dancing around her. Where's Percy and why isn't he dancing with you? How have we managed to lose Percy? Oh, that man! I lost him in the lounge several times. Now he's disappeared. I lost him in Framlingham. Yeah, oh dear. A bit too independent well, spirited for you, I think. Well, mommy. here he's a bit of a worry because he doesn't speak a word of French. There he is. There is he. Well, I well, yes, there. he is. There he is. <laughs> No. Of course, Sal, please, you're worried. Well, how mysterious. Where do you always go? You're quite an eel of a man. Oh, quite a what? Oh, eel. Eel? An, an eel. eel of a man? What an is eel. eel of a man? Oh, an <laughs> eel. Oh, you slippery little eel of slippery a man. Slippery little eel All of a man. will be revealed in the fullness of time. Anyway, I'm very glad you're back. Thank you know, we won a many more. Did you not know that? Yes, I, I had heard that. Not showing it much, are you? Disappearing every five minutes. As a child visiting this chateau, I remember being a little bit disappointed in the gallery, which is ridiculous because it's the most famous thing about the Chateau de Chenonceau, but it's just a place for promenading up and down and is only used at parties other than that. There's no furniture in it. And if I ever had the chance to take over the living in this chateau, I would make the entire gallery into a glorified bedsit. I'd have a beautiful four-poster bed, library, squishy sofas, everything in this room. Just the kitchens downstairs. And I think I'd never leave it. But this gallery's also been used for far more important things than dances. In the Second World War, the River Cher was the line between the occupied zone and free France. And this gallery was used to smuggle resistance members into the free zone. They were running through here to get free from the German occupation. Yeah. Well, that, so. that brings a whole new way of looking at the gallery. Yeah. Go, Mommy, go. Go, go, come in. Now we're off to see the kitchens, which are in the pillars of the bridge over the Cher. Imagine the bustle down here as the staff prepared for the lavish parties above. They even had water in their own, in the kitchen. Um, yes. I'm really excited to see the baguette moulds here because last month I went to a brocante with Marie and bought three of them for our bread oven room as well. By putting away a very good treasure that I got, two euros each. The wicker baskets that French bakers used to proof the baguettes before putting them in the bread oven. Mm -hmm. And we now have them for our bread oven room. We just need to bake something. Well, I think we might need to put new oil cloth in them first, for hygiene's sake. Yes, there's a bit of a bug in here. Bit of a bug, we won't let that go in the bread. Oh, dear bread. Okay, let's go. I'm very pleased with this purchase. And back inside the Chateau de Chenonceau, I'm feeling just a little bit smug at the fact that our bread oven is much bigger than theirs. I think our oven is somewhat bigger than it is this a lot one. Bigger, is. isn't it? Yes. Quite surprised at how small it is. This was the servants' dining room, and judging by the size of that fire, it must have been one of the warmest places in the chateau. Here's the magnificent kitchen built into the archway of the bridge, and I can't wait to show you the cooker. Look, it's the same as the one at Lalande. Unbelievable, though our copper's really not that shiny. One of the things that I love most about this chateau is that walking through it is like walking through every aspect of womanhood, from powerful politician to devout worshipper, through lover, mother, wife, and up in the attic, widow. This was the bedroom of Louise de Lorraine, the widow of Catherine de Medici's son, Henry III. 
He never did provide her with an heir to France, but she loved him dearly, and after his death, she cloistered herself away in Chenonceau. She dressed in white from that day forward and had her bedroom painted black, covered with white ostrich feathers of mourning. It is a deeply gloomy place. I think it's fair to say that Louise had a bit of difficulty moving on. We're in the gift shop and Marie is with us in spirit because there's this stunning book called The Bouquets of Chenonceau and I'm thinking of her flower arrangements. These are exquisite. I love this one with the green beans still in their pods. <gasps> Absolutely heavenly. We must eat things like this at La Lande. Marie, come back. I've got new ideas. I've absolutely loved this voyage through womanhood at the Chateau de Chenonceau. And I'm inspired to spend the rest of my life trying to leave behind a fraction of the beauty that these formidable women managed to leave here. Have you enjoyed it, Mummy? Very much, darling. I thought that you should have a memento of our visit to Chenonceau. Oh, Is that why you disappeared? So that's Marcy? why I disappeared. Oh, how lovely of you. And romantic. I thought you should have one as well. Oh, no oh. way. <gasps> Dan, Thank you. I just told you that you were not romantic. You tell me many things which <laughs> turn out to be wrong. <laughs> A lovely porcelain. Lovely Lisa, that's oh, lovely. Oh, lovely, darling. Thank you. Oh, it's beautiful. Isn't it lovely? It's absolutely lovely. Oh, Mummy, we have the same. Oh. We'll be matching. We've got matching necklaces. Okay, wear it immediately. Very nice. Oh, Percy, I love it. Thank you so much. Well, I thought that would make you remind you of our visit all together. It Thank will always you, remind me of our honeymoon, just the three of us. <laughs> <laughs> and her mother came to <laughs> And her daughter came too. <laughs> Asked not to do so. Still her daughter came too. <laughs> I knew I'd managed to persuade them to come on honeymoon with me. Yes. Jerry, eat your heart out. You're going to have to pull something major out of the bag to get them to go on honeymoon with you. Buckingham Palace, perhaps, Gerald? <laughs>